So for our lunch conversation, we really wanted to kind of change the conversation a bit and focus a lot on online communities. Because for many, the internet might not feel like it is for them or it's not inclusive of outside voices. Um, and today's speaker is working to change that. And she's doing so in a place that uh, a lot of people think is not all that inclusive, the gaming world and online gaming specifically. Anna Prosser Robinson works for Twitch, uh, which I just learned last night um, is more than I thought it was. It's a live online streaming platform that I thought was just for video games. That is not the, the case anymore. It's much broader than that, and she can tell you a bit more about that. Um, it has over, and I'm sure this number has gone up since the number I saw, 100 million unique visitors per month. So it's growing, and if you don't know about Twitch, you will. Um, she's also a founder, and really the reason we invited her, despite the fact that Twitch is awesome, she's the founder of MissClicks, which is a channel on Twitch. Um, and the goal of MissClicks is to be a place where people of all genders and backgrounds can participate in gamer culture without fear, prejudice, and harassment. Their motto at MissClicks, which is also awesome, is build up, never tear down. So please welcome Anna Prosser Robinson. Thanks so much. I have been told, I have been asked because I'm kind of the, the wild card, which I think means I'm just kind of the weirdo. So uh, thank you for having this weirdo to come chat with you guys. I hope that I can provide something interesting and of value to talk about with uh, inclusivity in online communities. And let me give you a little bit of background on what MissClicks is, why I started it, and that will kind of give the, the canvas upon which we can paint everything else. MissClicks was started when I started working in eSports. eSports, for people who might not be familiar with it, are competitive video game tournaments. And back when uh, MissClicks was started, competitive video game tournaments were popular, but maybe not quite mainstream, if you can even call them mainstream now. For context, uh, competitive eSports tournaments now, some of the biggest, like the International for Dota 2, which is a multiplayer online battle arena game, gives out prize pools of millions upon millions of dollars. Uh, pro teams, winners, individual winners will win a million dollars or more in, in playing those tournaments and they play for sponsored teams who pay them salaries and give them accommodations and all these kinds of things. So that's now. Back then, a few, a few years ago, it was not quite so large, but there was a, a group of us who were so passionate about video games, we loved the community around competitive video games, that we were working to create media and events and things that uh, people could participate in in order to be a part of this video game community. And I became very involved in that community through media because I specifically met some players that I really loved. One of them is now my husband. Uh, and uh, I, I learned that so many people wanted to watch these video games and so many people wanted to participate, but the only access they really had was the, the games themselves, the recordings of the video games being played against each other. They didn't have much access to the players themselves and their stories and their narrative. So I kind of got involved from that side. And as I continue to do that and kind of work toward making it a hobby and then maybe a part-time job and then maybe something that could become a career, I became very passionate about seeing people like me also succeed in that space. Um, there were a few other women that I worked with and at that point I think I could probably count the other women that I worked with in the esports space on two hands. And we kind of got together and we were like, you know, we see all these compelling, bright women with these these great capabilities come into our space and we're so excited about what they're going to do and then we kind of look around in six months to a year and they're gone. And we can't figure out why that is. We hypothesize, it was for, for a few reasons. One, that harassment is very easy online. It's very easy to anonymously tell someone, you're different, I notice you're different and therefore I am going to make fun of you because it makes me feel powerful. And that happened to a lot of women in the space because there were so few of us. And so um, <laughs> being that, Making a place for yourself in a new industry is already hard. Making yourself a space in something that's basically entertainment is also hard. And then doing that as a minority who may experience harassment on top of that makes it sometimes just not worth it. So we thought that might be the reason. We also looked at ourselves and thought, why are we still here? And at that time, it was four of us women. And we kind of looked at each other and we're like, well, you're kind of the reason I'm still here. Because when I feel like, you know what, this isn't worth it anymore, you tell me it is worth it. And you tell me that you need me and you need me to stay. And that gives me a reason to stick around. So out of that, the idea for Miss Clicks was born. We started thinking, how can we create something that will inspire other women, give them a space to either see representation or, or be part of a support network that will help them stay in esports. Um, and <laughs> 
funny, funny enough, we actually didn't do anything esports for our first, our first endeavor. We created a live Dungeons and Dragons role playing show. And we, <laughs> we had all four of us women playing Dungeons and Dragons live on a Twitch channel, and that's where we started. From then on, we did lots of things for a while. We had a news uh, website that kind of grabbed stories about women in esports. We had some esports talk shows. We had some Let's Play shows. We had all sorts of things. And it kind of has grown and evolved since then. So that's the background of MissClicks that I'm working on. I'm going to tell you a lot more about what Twitch is and how Twitch works so we can get even more background. And I've been asked to answer questions. So I'm hoping that by giving you guys a lot of kind of the idea of what experience I do have to offer, that you guys will have lots of questions that I might be able to give insight on. So moving on into, into telling you even more about what I can provide insight on. I'll let you know, my background is in speech communication and international studies. It's not in video games. It was uh, in, in media and performance. And so that gives me much of a focus on kind of the how do we communicate with each other and the linguistics and the uh, social science aspects of what I do. The, um, I also was not only a media person in esports, I also um, hosted a lot of tournaments, so I'm on stage a lot, and I also was involved with a pro gaming team. I once picked up my entire life from Portland, Oregon, and I moved to Arizona into a, a large, large house with eight to 14 uh, men at any given time who were professional video game players, and it was my job to create media around them and make sure they didn't destroy the house. So. <laughs> Uh, I lived there for about three years, and my job was simply to manage a pro gaming team as they practiced in this facility. So I have lots of great stories about that life decision. Uh, <laughs> I also now am the lead producer for Twitch Studios. So like I said, I'll talk a little bit more about Twitch, but that means that I spend most of my time thinking about what kind of content Twitch should be making for Twitch on Twitch to be distributed by Twitch. Um, so I'm, I'm a, a video producer. And then I also, like I said, co-founded MissClicks, and uh, I have it parenthetically there for you that I was Miss Oregon USA. I put it in parentheses because it's, it's not necessarily important to what we're talking about today, but I, I can't seem to be able to escape it whenever I <laughs> am introduced. No one will let me live it down. And it does inform a lot of my thoughts on how women should be allowed to express themselves in multitudes of different ways and not be put in any kind of box because I have had that experience. In terms of uh, the perspective I have, I have an interesting perspective in that I'm between millennials and Gen X in this like tiny little sliver of generation that remembers before the internet, but mostly grew up with the internet. So I remember my father explaining the internet to me. I remember him uh, building our first PC, and we were the first people on the block to have a personal computer. So I remember time before that, but I also grew up with it. So I've spent most of my time feeling like online communities were my space, but I also remember what it was like without them. Um, I also spend a lot of time as both an in and out group member. I, um, I am a woman in esports, which has been something of a, a minority experience for me, but I also am a, 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 a white person making media, which is a majority on Twitch. So I spend a lot of time being both in and out and a minority and a majority. Um, and the reason that I am here talking to you about this, the reason that I created MissClicks, is because I'm an enthusiast for inclusivity. And I say enthusiast because I often want people to know I'm not, I'm not qualified to do this. <laughs> I didn't study this. I, didn't, uh, I don't have special insight other than the fact that I've just been there and I care a lot about it. And I've tried a lot of things, some that worked and some that didn't, and I'm still trying. So that's me. I hope you have questions for me. Um, but now let's get into talking about what Twitch is, so that you guys have a, a sense of where I'm coming from and where the communities that I'm specifically looking at are. These are four different uh, Twitch channels, and I know it's kind of small, but I'll explain to you what each of them is. On the, uh, the upper left there, that is my husband's live stream channel. So he's a content creator. His main job is to every day stream live video gameplay and talk about what he's doing and interact with his community. So on the right-hand side of each of those, you see that white area with text. That's his chat. That's where his community hangs out. That's where they can talk to him, talk to each other, and interact with the content that's being made. I would say that's the majority of what you'll find on Twitch, is an individual content creator, usually playing games of some kind, having a personality and an entertainment, and interacting with the people that they're, um, they're entertaining. Right below that, you'll see a more large-scale kind of sports-looking broadcast, if you can see that one so small. That's the international. So that is a highly produced sports event-style thing about video games. 
And again, in, in that chat, that would be moving a lot faster. So uh, my husband's channel, In Control TV, his would be moving kind of slowly. They would be talking a little bit about what's happening and maybe having side conversations about things they went through that day because they know each other very well. Whereas for the international, for Dota 2, it would be moving very fast. It would be almost impossible to have any kind of coherent conversation. It's more of a crowd cheering type of feeling. On the upper right is actually our live stream Dungeons and Dragons game. So you can see that in that case, we're not looking at a video game so much as we're looking at multiple people role playing and, and chatting and playing a game. And again, that chat would be a little bit slower. And then below that um, is an example of something that is not gaming on Twitch. It's our sneaker show that we produce out of Twitch Studios. It's a show about um, sneaker collectors and the fandom of sneakers and fashion. So, um, and that one you can see a lot of emotes used in the chat. That's an important thing to know about Twitch is that not only can you type chat messages with text that um, any average person would probably be able to read and understand. There are emotes on Twitch that are completely specific to Twitch. And so it's almost a new linguistic system that if you're not familiar with it, you might not even understand it, you might misinterpret it, or you might have to learn it. In that case, they're using emotes to vote for which sneaker they like best. Um, on the international, you can see they're using kind of star emotes to denote a, a special message, or they're using a face to denote excitement. So. Those are, are some of the things that you might see on Twitch. You can also see on the left-hand side listed are all of my friends or channels that I follow. There's places where I can link to watch past broadcasts, but generally when you tune into Twitch, you're going to be watching a live broadcast and interacting with other people watching that live broadcast. So knowing kind of where I'm coming from, what Twitch is, what misclicks is, and why I'm here, that narrows my focus when talking about inclusivity in online communities. And it means that I focus mostly on content and on online spaces, because that's where most of the communities that I'm dealing with center around. They center around something that they're watching or consuming or um, hearing a story told, or they are finding a space that is their own. Um, as that kind of generational gap child that I was, I spent a lot of time in online spaces that sometimes felt more like home than real life spaces. I spent uh, hours and hours on AOL Instant Messenger talking to friends that I maybe hadn't even met in real life or rarely got to see in real life. And those spaces were just as real to me as the real life spaces, which is, is different from the experience of, say, my parents. Uh, they, they think that's very sad. <laughs> so, um, so I think a lot about how do we make those spaces into something that is uh, safe, that has positive norms, and that gives people agency to interact in those spaces. And as I think about content, I think about what are we representing in that content that makes people feel like a community is a safe place for them or like they're represented in that community. So all this leads to the question of kind of what should inclusivity really look like in online spaces and how do we move ourselves in that direction from what a lot of people consider to kind of be a wild, wild west situation. So first we have to back up a little bit and, and make sure we understand why inclusivity actually is important. Uh, some would argue that maybe it isn't. Some would argue that the internet should be a completely wild, wild west free place and that it doesn't actually matter if you are represented because the internet is a meritocracy and if you are good, you will get seen. I personally don't agree with that. But at least where we, I think we can all agree is that uh, diversity and inclusivity are positive things and, and that's been proven. First of all, most of us here would agree, I hope, that inclusion is right. Welcoming other people is right. Uh, making sure that everyone's ideas are being represented is right. If you don't buy that, at least you probably recognize the bottom line, that more customers is always going to be better. More people involved in what you're doing is always going to be better. So if I can welcome more groups of people and include those groups of people, that's going to help my bottom line in the end. Also, there have been plenty of studies that show that diverse groups or, or teams that are not uh, one type of person perform much better. So if I'm trying to achieve a goal, if I'm trying to uh, hone an idea, it behooves me to have lots of points of views. And that's been, that's been proven very well. In the context of what we're speaking about here in terms of free speech, I think it's really important to denote kind of the reality of inclusivity in that I can be part of a community, I can have the right to use my voice to express myself, but if I don't feel safe doing so, if I don't feel included, if I don't feel represented, there are many factors that will make me decide not to use my right of freedom of speech meaning it doesn't matter what, whether I have it or not. So in the context of what we're talking about here, it's very, very important that people are included and that inclusivity is managed. And then finally, as we move into this world where being online is 
synonymous with doing your daily life, especially for, for those of us in the tech sphere in San Francisco. This is, my phone is an extension of my ability to do my job, of my relationships with other people. So as that online culture becomes more and more pervasive, we have to look at online culture not as a subculture, not as an, an other type of thing, but as a world culture issue, as something that we all have to pay attention to and make sure grows in a positive way, the same way that we would human society in general. That said, let's move forward into thinking about paper. I don't work with paper very often, you guys. I usually work with screens. There we go. <laughs> let's take a look, a deeper look at content. And what does inclusivity mean when we talk about content? I'm trying to relate online communities, like I said, and thinking about online communities uh, being real world communities. I'm trying to relate them to things that we know in our society. So I think of content as kind of our oral tradition, our way of telling stories, our way of representing the narrative of humanity. So when we think about what should content look like if it's part of an inclusive community, we think first it should have diverse representation. I should be able to look at a community and say, oh, there's multiple different types of people here. And maybe there's someone who kind of looks like me. So that makes me feel like, okay, I can, I can be part of this and this is for me. It also means that those depictions of people are not only diverse, but they, that they respect the fact that humans are individuals. And not every woman, for example, is depicted as the same type of person or has the same reason for existing. Every individual is represented as someone who um, has flaws and has agency and is interesting and complex like all humans are. It's also important that we think about this media being accessible. Um, that could mean physically, meaning can someone who has a physical disability also enjoy this content? And if not, how could they feel included? It also could mean economically. If I don't have the means to enjoy this content, does that mean it's not for me and why am I not being included? And that's especially important when we think about things from a product perspective of a company needing to make money, but also needing to make certain things accessible if they want people to feel included as part of their community. And then also psychologically, and I, I get pretty touchy-feely when I talk about this stuff. You know, it's not super scientific, but it's pretty, pretty easy to explain to someone that if I have uh, emotional scarring or I have fears or I have personal issues that make it impossible for me to enjoy content because of the way that it affects me, we joke about trigger warnings and all that, but uh, I will not consume that content. I will not watch it. I will not be part of the community. So how are we signaling to people what they might be able to consume uh, from a psychological perspective. And then I think it's also really important, and this is a personal opinion, to think about the meaning of content, what the narrative is that we're putting forward and whether that narrative is constructive and positive or destructive. Um, that, that meaning could be as simple as, this is supposed to make you laugh or this is supposed to make you forget everything else. Maybe that's as simple as it is. But if a, con if a piece of content doesn't have any meaning, we should be examining why it exists in the first place. Now, if we want to achieve all those things, how do we make them happen? How do we make them become the norm? Because it doesn't necessarily, especially in gaming, happen naturally. Uh, it's a very white male dominated place. Most of the best esports players, for example, are white males. Most of the most successful broadcasters on Twitch are white males. So how do we, uh, without destroying kind of the merit of what they've done, how do we make sure that we are showcasing this diversity and this inclusivity that we want to, to show? So, the reason that we started with a show that just showed women's faces playing Dungeons and Dragons is because we wanted that to be normal. We were tired of people saying, oh, what, you're, you're a girl and you play video games? Oh, the boys must really like that. Oh, you know, and having to kind of agree that we were unicorns. You know, we, we didn't like that. And so um, when we started playing our Dungeons and Dragons game, every, let's say five minutes, someone would pop in the chat and say, what, I didn't know girls played Dungeons and Dragons. And you know, on the one hand, that was frustrating, but on the other hand, it was exciting because we were showing people a new side of this content, a new face that they might not have expected to see. Now, I think we get that maybe once a session, which still is, is too much, but it's much less. So we've kind of uh, normalized that visible diversity, and, and I hope that we'll continue to do that in all sorts of online spaces. It's also important that not only the people who are being shown in the media are diverse and inclusive, but also that there are teams of creators behind those things and, uh, and making those things that are diverse and inclusive. Because uh, making, having one person be the sole evaluator of content is not gonna give you the diversity of points of views that is going to create the best, most compelling, most inclusive content. So not only who's shown on it, but who's behind the scenes thinking about it and making it and making decisions about that content. 
on, on the, you know, there's so many layers to this, right? There's the people who make it, there's the people who are seen, and then there are the people who are receiving it. And their feedback is very valuable too. Because all of us have experienced something where we tell a story and it has a certain intention, or we say a statement and it has a certain intention, but the interpretation is not what we intended. That's gonna happen a lot when we're trying to tell stories that are inclusive. And I think it's very, very important to have those open feedback channels that allow us to evaluate, did we achieve the message we were trying to send? Did we achieve showing the representation that we were trying to show? And then taking and integrating that feedback. And then as we talked about meaning, make, taking the time to sit back on every piece of content and think, why did we make this? What is the point of this? And are we achieving the goals that we set out? I think is very important. So that, that's what we think about when we think about our oral tradition. And on misclicks, what that means is thinking about um, why have we created any given show on our Twitch channel. A good example of, um, of something that didn't work was, like I said, we, we had a news site for a while. We were trying to, to grab a whole bunch of stories about women doing things in esports. All of us have full-time jobs, and all of us are trying to make it in esports as well, and the site would suffer. It was not very good. It didn't, um, it didn't grab stories about a diverse swath of women. It just kind of grabbed stories about people that we knew because we saw them and we put them on the site. And so we decided to close that down because the, the purpose of the site was to give exposure to and to help people discover new women in the gaming space. We were not doing that. But what we were doing well was putting women's faces on shows where they previously might not have been often seen. So that's what we leaned into. And now we focus on just having content on a Twitch channel. So let's move on to online interactions and spaces. So in Twitch, um, both of these things are inextricably linked, right? We have the content that you're watching and also the space that you're hanging out in are both the same place. If I'm watching a Netflix show, for example, my online space might be Twitter. I'm watching Netflix, I'm also live tweeting the show I'm watching, or I um, am in a chat room talking to my friends about it. So these might be separate, but in my case, they're usually, um, they're usually one and the same. And these online spaces can be thought about as our home. When we're thinking about how, where's the real world allegory here, we're looking at whose house is this and, and who is supposed to feel comfortable here and who makes the rules here. So for misclicks specifically, the, the rules got made by the people who started the channel and the rules were we want everyone to feel safe first and foremost. Now safety can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but for us it meant we want you to feel safe uh, physically. No one should come in here and threaten to find where you are. Also, we want you to feel safe uh, emotionally. We don't want anyone harassing you. We don't want anyone making you feel other or outside. We want everyone to be welcome. Um, we also wanted to make sure that everyone felt like they had agency in their interactions, meaning we, we don't want you to come here and feel like you have to think or speak or do a certain way. We want you to feel free to express yourself in the confines of safety, right? Uh, making sure that you're not infringing on the safety of anyone else, but making sure that you have agency. And I think both of those things apply to almost any online space that we want to be inclusive. If we ignore safety, if we ignore agency, and we say, we gave you the space, you can go hang out in there and do whatever you want, the majority, the strongest group will ultimately overcome all of the other groups. So it's important that we maintain those things. And, and I think that, again, is very important to freedom of speech is that I, as a, I'm a minority voice, need to make sure that I'm safe to express that minority voice. Otherwise, I might damage my career, for example. Um, I had to make a lot of choices early on in esports where I had experienced something um, very, very bad at the hands of someone else. I wanted to speak out about it, but because there was no safety, because I had very little agency and I was at the mercy of a few companies that determined whether I was going to be able to work for the rest of the year, I made the decision to stay silent and not express some of the horrible things that had happened to me, which I don't regret to this day because I was able to be successful, but I don't want anyone else to have to make those decisions. So I think it's very important that we preserve freedom of speech by making sure that people are safe and free from harassment um, or from being barred from opportunities by expressing themselves. Then, of course, it's really um, I, something I feel very, very passionate about is thinking about an online space in the same way that we think about a society, thinking about how do we develop positive norms here? How do we get people to understand how uh, the, the rules and manners and etiquette? Because I think a lot of times we think of online spaces as separate from that, as because of the anonymity, there's no way to have norms or rules. But that's one of the things that I feel like MissClicks has been very successful with, with, which is you come into our chat, there's a rules pop up that says, hey, if you're going to chat here, Here's how we talk to each other. You, are you going to click OK? Awesome. You clicked OK. Now you're allowed to talk. 
Now, if you talk and uh, it's something that's kind of objectionable, then there will be a moderator there to be like, hey, friend, so glad you're here, but uh, we don't talk to each other that way. Don't do it again, okay? And usually what happens when that person is treated with respect and, and educational uh, bent and supported by the rest of the people who are there to enjoy that content, usually the behavior will change. Sometimes not, and that's when we get to the final point, which is there's infrastructure there to educate, but if a person will not be educated, if a person continues to do things that are destructive to the positivity of the community or make someone feel unwelcome or make them feel attacked, then there is infrastructure to remove them or to make it so that they can't talk. Um, a great example of this is often when we play Dungeons and Dragons, someone will come in and uh, there's a, we have a male DM, Dungeon Master, makes all the stories, and then four women who play the, the characters. So a lot of times someone will come in and say something to the effect of like, oh look, it's the DM in his harem. And that makes us feel other, it makes us feel objectified, it makes us feel as though we are not humans with agency, and so usually what will happen is we'll say, hey, that makes us feel bad, don't do that. And then that person says, oh gosh, sorry. I, I won't do that again, and they stay in our community, and then they become someone who helps us perpetuate those norms to others and educate them. Once in a while, that person doubles down, says even more horrible things, and that's when we start to say, all right, we're glad you stopped by, but you no longer can speak here. You know, you can keep watching our content and, and providing us with a viewer, but unfortunately, you're not adding to our conversation. So if we look at all of these as the goals, how do we accomplish these? It's really important that we have tools that allow us to do those things, to have that infrastructure. The ability to have a moderator in chat, for example. If I have a chat that has no, um, if I'm the only one, if I'm broadcasting and I'm the only one who can take action against um, users in my chat, then that means I have to see every message, I have to experience every feeling, and I also have to take time away from the content I'm creating in order to deal with that person. And that takes time away from all the other people I'm trying to serve with the content, with the online space. So having moderators, for example, having um, the tools, the simple tools to mute someone or ban someone from a channel or um, even to, uh, with, with Automod on Twitch, which is a fascinating piece of machine learning language uh, analyzing software, will actually um, use that learning to pull out messages that may be suspicious based on what I've told it I don't want and, let, and hold it for me until I have a second to check on it. So we need tools like that to help us manage those spaces. We also need education programs, we need consciousness around these things because it's really easy to look at the norm and think that's just always ha how it has been, that's how it should be, and not to think about it, but it's very important to elevate the voices that are saying like, hey, I don't feel represented, I don't feel part of this and I want to, and I, I connect with this but I don't feel like I can express myself here. So making sure that there are educational resources around this and that we're uh, building up those messages is really important. And then uh, finally making sure that if it gets beyond, you know, I'm talking about misclicks as my house, and if it gets beyond my house and I, I can't handle it within my house, being able to report that person to a larger entity, in this case Twitch, being able to say, hey, this person has gone beyond my ability to keep myself and my community safe, I need your help. And having kind of a thoughtful process around that and making sure that the, the structures in making sure that that person is um, dealt with in whatever way is appropriate is really important. So, those things in mind, thinking about how I want to create inclusive content that makes great representation, and I want to create spaces that have a, a welcoming feeling for everybody. I've, I've tried a lot of things, <laughs> and, I, and all of them have had some successes, and all of them have had some challenges that maybe didn't go so well. Um, one of the things that I did upon uh, starting to work at Twitch was start the Twitch Inclusivity Group, which at that time was me and four other friends that were like, hey, you know what, we care about this, and let's just get together at lunch and talk about it every week and see what happens. Um, and that started something really cool that eventually has now grown into a group of over 200 people at Twitch who get together once a month to talk about it and share things together in, in multiple groups to kind of make sure that our projects are working together to be inclusive. And that's all at a grassroots level. It's not something that Twitch um, started or even officially endorsed. It's a, an extracurricular club of Twitch members who care about this thing. The challenge with that was that when we first started, we thought, you know, we're going to be a group that does projects together, and we're all going to coordinate, and we're going to make big changes here at Twitch, and we're going to do big things. Unfortunately, we all also have full-time jobs that have other responsibilities that are completely unrelated to inclusivity. So we learned very quickly that pushing projects to the next level and kind of taking ideas from the concept stage to the 
let's all work together to make this happen stage was very difficult. So we had to adjust and make it more of a kind of information and opportunity sharing network as opposed to something that was moving projects forward. With misclicks, the success was education and very strict boundaries that made a really positive community that affected a lot of people positively. We, and, and when I say a lot of people, I don't mean like a huge group. I mean a, a fairly small group in the scheme of things, but enough people that it was impactful. People would write us stories that say, hey, I, I was scared to speak up on Twitch because I feel like my particular minority group is not represented, or I'm harassed in other channels, but I can come to yours and I know you'll protect me. And I, that helps me feel part of this. And so that was our success. The challenge was that, again, this was a group of volunteers, of people who just wanted to make something cool together where people could come, feel included, and um, where, where we could be supported. So what that meant was that we had a lot of attrition over the years. Of the four uh, women who started Misclicks, I'm the only one who still actively works on it. Um, and we also have had a lot of kind of bandwidth problems, where all of us are trying to do lots of good things in the world. So if I think, you know, here's my list of things that I need to do, my real full-time job, and then a few activists things that I want to do, and then here's misclicks, which is kind of doing fine on its own, but I know there are a lot of things we should improve. It moves very slowly. So our big challenge there was if we don't have resources, if it's not our full-time thing, if it's not something we can focus on, it's going to move very, very slowly. Some of the other things that I've been uh, privileged to work on are industry working groups, where I was able to um, kind of meet up with people from all over the industry and talk about these challenges and get ideas. And it would always be so, so inspiring, and I got so much from that that helped me move forward on my own projects. But anytime we tried to, again, work on a big project altogether, a lot of times the challenge was follow-up, because again, it wasn't able to be prioritized when it wasn't something that was uh, career-dependent. And then finally, I did talk a little bit about Twitch chat tools. I think Twitch, if you ever get the chance to look into what they do with moderating their chat and the tools that they give users, it's fascinating. And I think they're at the forefront of figuring out how to, how to give streamers and communities the tools to make their own decisions about what their community looks like, as opposed to making them for them. Um, the success there is that I see increased agency. The challenge is that measuring whether someone feels comfortable or whether someone feels included is kind of hard. So being able to report on those things is something that I have no understanding of how to do, but that the Twitch science team is working actively on. Overall, as we're talking about how to make these things happen, I think my biggest message is that if you're going to try to work toward making a difference for inclusive online communities, there are a lot of specific things you can do, but I think the biggest learning for me has been to, to do a lot of work on myself, to think about having a lot of patience, meaning First of all, waiting for change and still believing in it, even if it doesn't happen right away. And also patience with people, because we're all people. Patience with myself for all the times that I make the wrong call or the wrong decision, or I don't understand something about inclusivity, even when I'm telling it to people as though I should be in a position of leadership. So patience, openness to other people's ideas about inclusivity that challenge my own, because I am only one point of view, and at the very nature of inclusivity is collecting other points of view. Courage to stand up when it's not going to be popular at all, and uh, to be willing to take some of the flack that comes from standing up for inclusivity and for standing up for change in a community that people feel very passionately about preserving, especially something like gaming. And humility, being, being willing to express that I actually don't know all the answers. I'm just here to try to facilitate something happening. That's been my, my biggest learning, is being able to personally kind of handle that. And I know we, we need to have time for questions, so I'll, I'll try to rush through this, but just some of the things to avoid is to make sure that uh, in, in the name of patience, we avoid that fatigue that comes from a big picture that can sometimes be kind of bleak, and instead focus on those little actionable things that we can do each day to make things better. And uh, looking at a holistic approach that, that thinks about a person as a human, as opposed to myopically thinking about, here's a user behavior, I want to mitigate that user behavior, I made this technology that does that, now it's fixed. Thinking instead about, what does a human want when they come to this space? What do we want to give that human in terms of experience, and how can we use their humanity to make a positive experience for them and us? Um, how do we look at this as a society, as opposed to a, a chat room that may not feel human? And then, um, you know, again, same thing. We often seem to apply tech instead of social science. We often seem to focus on the punitive as opposed to the educational or transformative. And sometimes we see our goals as so important that we become so rigid in them that we don't notice that the needs around us have actually changed. So making sure that we avoid that rigidity is important. So what I'd leave you with is if you, if you 
look at online communities and you think, man, I would like those to be more inclusive, but I just, I don't really know how to tackle this. There are a few things that we can do in our communities and in our industries and in our companies, and a few things that I think we can each actionably do on a, a, a minute level every day or even starting today. So first, keep that memory of dealing with human people when we're dealing with users, that generally there is a level of humanity in everyone that we can use and that we can respect. Also, devote resources to this, because most of the failings that I've seen in inclusivity are because people expect others to, to work on inclusivity and diversity out of the goodwill of their own heart and on their free time, and that makes progress very, very slow. So I think it's very important that companies, especially who care about this, invest time, money, and hiring into diversity and inclusion initiatives. And then actively seek out points of view that are different from your own. And that has a lot to do with free speech, of course. But making sure that not only are you open to receiving, but that you are actively going out and looking for perspectives that contradict your own in order to create the best and most inclusive environment. As far as what we can do now, I love trying to find someone on Twitter who is doing something good for inclusivity and retweeting them every day. I don't always do it, but it's something that makes me feel like I'm, I'm taking a step in the right direction. So that courageous signal boost is important. And then taking ownership of grassroots opportunities. When a company won't let you do anything about it, or when a community doesn't seem to want to change, just finding that one next step, that one thing I can do today to get things closer to where I'm going. And that one step usually leads to something much bigger, as I experienced with the inclusivity group. And then, again, as I've said, <laughs> having openness and patience is tantamount. So I hope that uh, my, my strange, weird experience has had some value to you, and I hope that you might have questions that I can answer about inclusive communities, but I hope that as we think about freedom of speech, we just remember that it's very important to make sure that freedom of speech is aided by the feeling of inclusiveness in online communities. I think there's uh, microphones headed around if anybody has a question. Thanks for your excellent speech. Uh, I met a gentleman from the Embassy of Italy about a year ago, and he told me that the only way this theory of yours, a scientific theory on the rise of the equatorial seas due to centrifugal force, the spin of the earth pushing the melting water from the ice at the North and South Pole would proceed to the equator. He said, the only way this will ever go anywhere is through a video game. And I was so <laughs> shocked. And I, as you're an expert on video games, I wondered what you thought of this. It's a new method of speech or a new method of uh, proceeding uh, in presenting any issue uh, to the American public or the world public. Mm. Uh, do, any thoughts on this? Sure. So basically, what is a video game in, in the definition of modern society? Um, I've heard a lot of people uh, liken video games to fine art, which I think has some merit. I think it's really important to consider the fact that the same way that a film can create a narrative experience that you can take in and be affected by emotionally, a video game can also do that. I've also seen video games be uniquely capable of um, utilizing human ingenuity to solve problems. There have been really great examples of where um, a computer was working on a problem or a team of scientists was working on a problem, but someone created a video game, put it out there on the internet and said, hey gamers, help us figure out how to break this. They're really good at breaking things. <laughs> and, uh, and they were able to solve world problems. So I think we're just starting to tap the potential of the interactive medium that is video games in terms of, um, from the fine art perspective, being able to really emotionally connect with someone because they're participating in the story. And then also from the, um, problem-solving perspective of being able to kind of outsource thinking to people who are very good at strategy. I hope that answers your question. I don't know where the next, over here. Hi, um, a lot of this morning's conversation focused on the idea that bad speech can be overcome by more good speech, um, not so much in like a smaller community, but in the wider Twitch as a whole. Right. Um, can you, give some responses to that, particularly in the context of sort of the physical safety mm. challenges that you brought up earlier? Mm, that's a really good question. Uh, this morning prompted me to think very deeply about um, when a platform becomes so ubiquitous that it should be considered everyone's right to use it how they see fit and say whatever they want. I think that was a very interesting perspective because I um, often repeat that you know Twitch is 
our house, and we want our house to feel welcoming and inclusive. And if you don't like this welcoming and inclusive house, then go to a different house, and that's okay. That's a personal perspective, not officially Twitch. Um, but I, I do recognize that, um, that there is something to be said for the avoidance of censorship, and there is something to be said for making sure that multiple different ideas are represented. So the line, I think, between um, messages that can be considered violent in terms of harassment and messages that may be considered um, less desirable is very, it's very difficult to find. Um, I think that it's very important to maintain the safety of users, and I think that's what you're getting at. And Twitch has um, a unique set of challenges there in that when you are broadcasting live, usually from your home, um, it can be difficult to kind of make sure that your identity is kept safe, and so Twitch puts a lot of effort into that. Um, again, I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering your question, <laughs> but if not, give me more. I think you still have the mic over there. Is there any follow-up on that question? Uh, just to add, I, I think it would be useful for the room as a whole to maybe hear some examples of mm. the physical safety challenges uh, that women in gaming in particular have faced yes, online. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when, when dealing with um, the physical safety concerns that I have experienced most generally revolve around events. Usually when we're streaming from the comfort of our homes, then there is a level of safety in that you cannot reach out and touch me. <laughs> you cannot hurt me. Um, the exception to that, of course, is when people are able to find information about where I live online and use things like doxing or swatting to um, use resources to make me unsafe in my home. Usually, though, the physical safety concerns I'm dealing with are the fact that because women are so often objectified still in the video games industry, it can feel okay to, especially with women, touch people in a way that is inappropriate or invade the space of someone, especially around um, cosplay communities, people who are dressed up as video game characters, which because of the sexualization of women in video games are often very scantily clad, and that can be seen by some people wrongly as an invitation to invade personal space. So I would say those are some of the primary physical safety concerns that I've experienced. <laughs> Hi. Um, one of the things you talked about is, uh, for Twitch is that people are watching you do something. Can you explain why people would want to watch you play Dungeons and Dragons or any <laughs> kind of video game rather than play it um, themselves? Not that, though I love streaming games on Twitch. Um, I also, in another kind of free speech thing, um, there's been a, a little uh, disagreement between those who make the video games and those who stream video games for a living on mm. how to um, break up revenue and whether or not they actually have a right to stream somebody else's creation. So can you talk a little bit about um, how that situation is being resolved in terms of the free speech world and some of the legal arguments? Right. Okay. So um, why do people want to watch video games is a question I get often, which uh, I love to answer. The question is best answered by just watching a video game and trying to see whether you like it. And if you don't, then you just don't like watching video games. But <laughs> uh, I, I used to spend a lot of time sitting on the couch playing video games and passing the controller between me and my friends. And watching was just as fun in that case as playing myself. So that's one of the references I give for why people would want to watch video games. Another is sports. When you're watching, especially a professional video game player play a video game, you're watching it be played at the highest level, almost beyond probably what the video game, player, or the video game developer intended. For for example, when I watched my husband play StarCraft II, which was his pro game um, before he retired, uh, he, he moves so quickly and makes decisions so fast that it's inspiring and interesting for me to watch. More inspiring and interesting than if I were to play StarCraft myself, which is very slow. <laughs> um, in answering your other question about uh, sharing the revenue or the benefit from streaming a game online, I heard a really interesting um, conclusion from T.L. Taylor, and I can't remember the name of her most recent book. She does some great study on video games and streaming in particular, and she said that she had found uh, that in her opinion, the act of playing a video game contributes enough to the video game uh, creatively that that person is creating their own art and that they are streaming and sharing their own art. And I thought that's a very interesting way to look at it. I definitely am not qualified to, to talk about kind of the legality of who owns what IP in games, and I think I'm just as interested in learning about that as, as anyone here. But uh, I think that's a compelling argument because the people who stream video games are entertainers in their own right, bringing something to that video game that people would not watch if the person was not playing them. So the ownership there um, 
I find to be very creatively skewed toward the streamer. If that answers your question. Um, uh, hi, hi. <laughs> um, I got it. So um, I want to just ask two provocative questions based on two points that you made towards sure. the beginning. So you said the communities should be as inclusive as possible. But is there not something to be said for creating communities that are more highly targeted towards a specific you know, group of people? For example, maybe we don't want to include white supremacists and neo-Nazis mm. in our group. Mm. Secondly, um, I think you also said you know, anybody should be able to express themselves in that group. But similarly, using the same analogy, do we really want to invite neo-Nazis or white supremacists or, you know, pick your, um, you know, hate group into certain communities? Like, do you expect, say, Black Lives Matter to be inclusive of those people? Do you, I mean, can we really say that all ideas and all opinions should be welcome? And so how do you square, you know, obviously very legitimate goals of wanting to make it safe and secure for women and people of all gender identities, et cetera, to be involved in that community, but not necessarily adopt a set of principles that would make it difficult to then exclude pernicious and you know negative right. views. Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's something that we have been dealing with and struggling with on misclicks, particularly um, as as a lot of these kind of ideas that are contrary to the mission of misclicks have become so pervasive in online culture. In the past, we've focused specifically on the behavior of the user and not the opinion. So if they're coming in and respectfully providing. Um, an invitation to discourse around an idea, and that person gives us the opportunity to kind of condemn the bad idea in a, in a respectful way and to have discourse around it, generally we've allowed that. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that's necessarily the right plan, and I think there are a lot of people, even within misclicks, that disagree with me that that's the right way to do it, and I'm still kind of learning on whether or not that's the case. Um, but I think that when a person comes into a channel with no goal of discourse was simply the goal of spreading an idea or hurting someone or, or um, devaluing someone else's ideas. That's where we absolutely put our foot down and say no. Um, I know that's not a very decisive answer, but the, tr the truth is that, again, this is where I'm not an expert and just trying to kind of figure it out. That's it? Okay. Thank you guys so very much. I really appreciate the opportunity and all your thoughtful questions. <laughs>